There we go. So a big welcome to Eddie Patrician, who lives in Kimberly on the uh, traditional territory of the Tanaha people, and he's the conservation specialist for Wild Sight. Eddie works to improve logging practices on the ground and at a provincial level. He works on old growth protection, caribou recovery, recreation and land use planning. Eddie has a passion for wild places, adventure, and telling stories about the people, critters, and landscapes of home, the Kootenai and Columbia region. And the organization that Eddie works for, Wild Sight, is recognized as a leader in large-scale conservation, sustainable community initiatives, and environmental education since 1987. And Eddie's here today to talk about uh, the inland temperate rainforests. So I'll pass it over to you. And maybe you can tell us where that photo was taken as well. Awesome, thank you, Stephanie. Um, yeah, that photo was taken in uh, just kind of 120 kilometers north of, of Salmon Arm um, in, the, in the Seymour River area. Um, there's, the, there's the Adams River, which people might be familiar with, um, one of those really productive salmon rivers. Um, and then there's the the Seymour a little bit uh, a little bit to the to the east of that, and it's it's a phenomenal place. And and uh, I'll uh, I'll get into that um, as well. Great, thank you. Yeah, and I will just put up my slides. Let me know if you're if you're seeing my slides. Are we all good? Perfect. That's good. So yeah, I'm, I'm Eddie Patrician. I'm the conservation specialist for Wild Sight, and I'm based here in, in Kimberly, BC, and, and Tanaha Makis, and, and the territory of, of the Tanaha people. And, and I feel very fortunate to live and, and work in, in Tanaha territory and with a people and, and nation who have lived in relation and, and stewarded all living things for millennia. And just, you know, one sentence on wild site, um, we work to protect wildlife and, and water and, and wild places in, in, you know, the Columbia and Rocky Mountain region. And um, our education programs take, take, you know, thousands of kids outside just to, to get into their backyard and experience wild places. And, and our conservation programs are, uh, you know, um, helping to protect wild places and, and yeah. So today we're going to be talking about the broader inland temperate rainforest region, which encompasses the traditional territories of, of the Tanaha, the Sinaiks, uh, the Suquetmik, the Silex, um, and the Clay Clay Tene. And um, I'm really grateful to those nations who have, you know, uh, actively stewarded those lands since time immemorial. And I think there's that this incredible and deep connection and um and i want to acknowledge and, and honor um those nations who who continue to protect or practice culture and and steward their territories so when we refer to the inland temperate rainforest this is the ecosystem um we're referring to and and some people call this the interior wet belt. Um, and you can see it's, it's, a, it's a large chunk of, of land that stretches and encompasses, um, you know, the, the parts of the, the Purcell Mountains, um, kind of the, the Western section of the Purcells, uh, the Selkirks, um, the Monashies, and uh, you know parts of the Rocky Mountains as you get north of, of Golden, and then um, the Caribou Mountains. People are familiar with, with Wells Gray, um, and then of course the Upper Fraser ecosystem, and uh, you know north of, of Prince George area, uh, you have some of the subboreal spruce that's also included, um, and. It's, it's this incredible place. And, and I think, you know, the, the coastal rainforest has received a lot of attention and, and um, recognition, and, and that's obviously warranted, um, but the, the inland temperate rainforest hasn't. And at a global scale, um, these, these inland rainforests are, are even rarer. So on the right here, you have a, you have a map of the globe. 
and in blue you have um, temperate rainforests and, and if you can, can kind of see you can see the coastal temperate rainforest um, and you can see you know the coast of, of Peru and, and Chile there's some temperate rainforest and, and then you know there's some more stuff in, in Spain and Portugal um, for temperate rainforests, but there's not a whole lot of that red, which is inland temperate rainforest. And it, it really is one of the, the rarest ecosystems on, on earth. Um, you know, there's, there's portions of parts of Siberia and Eastern Russia, um, where you have inland temperate rainforests, um, a couple of parts of, of, um, South America, but, nothing really that's that's left and sizable and has um ecological function this is the bc's inland temperate rainforest is is what's left in a state that's still somewhat um intact and um so yeah i, I think this map just just kind of points out um points to that and and particularly you know, the, the true rainforest or, or kind of the crown jewel of the, these ecosystems are the, the cedar hemlock stands um, that most people would be most familiar with. And, and they really start once you get kind of north of Nelson um, in, in, you know, the goat range north. And then you're kind of in the heart of it from, from Revelstoke um, to the upper Fraser ecosystem. And uh, that's where you've, you've got all of these different rare, rare lichens and, and still some healthy caribou populations. And uh, yeah. And it's this ecosystem that is shaped by water and which often takes the form of snow. As many folks know, this place and these mountains are one of the snowiest places on earth. And snow really shapes the landscape from how glaciers form at the top of, of these valleys to how these big mountain streams that, that then meander down those valleys. And um, of course, at the bottom um, of those valleys, you have these rare cedar hemlock stands that have often been growing um, undisturbed since you know some of them possibly the end of the last ice age. So while the trees might be 400, 600, 800 years old um, in, in those really ancient stands, uh, the, the ecosystems are that much older and, and some of which have been growing undisturbed for thousands of years. And you're also at this mixing point. Um, you're at the convergence of, of more Northern ecosystems, um, like the boreal and more southern ecosystems, and also the convergence of these mountain ranges, and and that has a lot to do with precipitation, and, and you know the the Purcells, the Monashies, the the Selkirks, the Caribous. Um, storms have to go up and down these these mountain systems, and and they drop a lot of precipitation when they do. So all of that makes for diversity. And yeah, those those big glaciers. This is the Bourne Glacier uh, north of Revelstoke. But you can also see a, a human impact on the landscape, right, at, at left, these, these higher elevation cut blocks. And really, it's a, it's a powerful place. Um, big glaciers and powerful rivers and these old and ancient um, and incredible forests. and amazing alpine, uh, just really world-class. And, and in, in parts of uh, the ITR, you feel like you're more, more in the north on those big kind of rolling ridge lines and, and with, uh, you know, um, these, these spectacular kind of open meadowy areas. And, and yeah, those, th this is a, rolling ridge line and, and this is just above the Seymour River um, that I spoke about earlier and the wildflowers um, are in bloom and I've, I've never figured it quite out um, how to how to go to this region and go to the Alpine when the wildflowers are in bloom the mosquitoes always seem to be out and uh, they're out in full force. <laughs> 
So if anyone has any secrets there, please let me know. Um, and there's this incredible mix of, of powerful rivers and, and more meandering rivers and streams. And, and like this one, this is actually the Seymour again. And, and this is, uh, yeah, that kind of gravel bed floodplain. And, and it's a floodplain that's um, 800, more than 800 meters in, in width in places, um, makes for perfect beaver habitat and, uh, and moose habitat in well, as well, and, and caribou habitat in the winter. Um, and so all of that evolution and, and unique, um, you know, unique geography and, and microclimates has resulted in biodiversity. Um, which, yeah, the biodiversity in the temperate rainforest is incredible from, you know, rare mushrooms to rare plants. Um, and obviously I am, I am not an expert in, in a lot of those, those um, rare mushrooms and rare plants. Um, I, I just listen to, to what people say and, and um, try to interpret the science. And so, um, but there's, there's incredible diversity. Um, and often every, you know, square meter is, is covered in, in, um, in, you know, <laughs> fungi and, and, and yeah, it's, it's phenomenal. And of course, um, mountain caribou are, are an integral part of this ecosystem. And they've evolved to, to live in the ITR. And, and you know, after the ice age, caribou migrated um, south as, as glaciers retreated. And that's kind of the, the scientific consensus. Um, and they started to come into, into Southern British Columbia and they evolved with this inland temperate rainforest ecosystem. And, and to live um, in this ecosystem, they have various strategies, including dispersing themselves, themselves across the landscape. Obviously, um, you know, uh, other caribou, Arctic caribou, barren ground caribou, they're in these major herds and they, they migrate across these large swaths of, of land. Um, mountain caribou migrate elevationally, and um, that's a strategy to avoid predators. And they also um, are just in these smaller groups. And, and the only time they're in bigger groups is, is typically in the, in the late winter when they're all up high um, and, and they're, you know, living off uh, arboreal lichen, tree lichen. Um, and, and it's incredible how um, they, they've made this living in, in this ecosystem because um, it is harsh. And when you're at, at 6,000 feet in one of the um, snowiest places on earth uh, and you're existing exclusively on, on a boreal lichen, um, that's a pretty, a, it's a, a vulnerable position to be in. And, um, you know, these caribou are extremely vulnerable and they tell us a lot about the health of, of the ecosystem. And, and they're kind of a canary in the coal mine in, in that way. And, and we've been seeing um, as we disrupt and log this, this place, uh, we're seeing caribou retreat. And, and historically, um, even places like Southern Montana had mountain caribou um, up until the 1940s, a place called Mo Lolo Pass outside of Missoula. You had um, a population there and, and, and they learned pretty quickly that um, as they logged a lot of those forests, those caribou disappeared. And, and um, you know, so really we're, we're at that, um, that place. And, and this is a caribou from the South Selkirk population which was recently um, extirpated. And, uh, you know, um, that's, that's the reality. We've lost five subpopulations um, of, of mountain caribou in the last, um, in under, under, well, since 2014. Um, 
in the Selkirks and the Southern Purcells. And, and those are the caribou I, I grew up close to. Um, and uh, they're, they're such amazing critters. And, you know, talking about the range of, of caribou um, and this ecosystem, and they're essentially one and the same. So on the, on the left, you have um, the distribution of caribou. Um, and the lighter color is their historic range. Um, and this map is a few years old. Uh, so the present populations, some of these are already gone. Um, but you can see here, um, here's the South Selkirks. Here's the South Purcell population, uh, just, just to the west of Cranbrook, Nelson, um, the South Selkirks. And then as you go north, uh, here is the Central Selkirks, the Monashies, and uh, Columbia South, and Columbia North, and Groundhog, and Wells Gray. Um, and um, on the right, you have the range of inland temperate rainforest. And, and you know, these are, these are basically one and the same. Caribou need old growth forests um, and, and they've evolved to, to live in this ecosystem. And um, yeah, it's, it's phenomenal. And, and it also speaks to, you know, the, the, the shape of, of this ecosystem that, that these critters are, are disappearing. Um, and, and yeah, as, as I mentioned, you know, the South Purcell um, population's gone, the, the South Selkirk populations extirpated. Um, there's still a population in, in the central Selkirks here, but there's only about 28 of them. Um, and then the Monashi population's also, also gone. Um, there's four here in, in the Columbia South and Frisbee ground, Frisbee. Um, and then Columbia North is, is still healthy. Um, and really the trend is where we still have a lot of old growth forests or we still have some old growth forests. We still have caribou in those, in those places. Um, and yeah, that, that's kind of the, the overall trend. And yeah, I mean, I mean, they grow, you know, they, they only eat lichens that, that grow in old growth forests and, um, and a lot of these caribou use, use ancient cedar and hemlock stands. This photo is from, uh, a group in the late winter, uh, in, in the North caribou or North Columbia subpopulation, uh, North of Revelstoke. Um, and these caribou are, are down in low elevation cedar hemlock forests for up to 50% of the year in, in Columbia North and in, in the Blue River area as well. Um, so so they, they really do use those, those stands and, and um, caribou are quite amazing. You know, we're st even though they're one of the most studied animals in North America, people are still figuring things out about them. Um, a few years ago, um, a bunch of researchers in the, in the Arctic figured out that they can see in ultraviolet um, wavelengths. So they can see things below the ground and access their food um, and paw at, at, at their food because they can see in, in those ultraviolet wavelengths that, that we cannot, of course. Um, and, and these caribou, they, they paw at, at false box um, in the early winter is, is one of the things that, you know, to get under, they get under the snow and paw at, at those, that false box in, in a lot of hemlock stands. And, um, but really, um, yeah, especially in the North Columbia, um, that's kind of the, the last stronghold of, of, southern mountain caribou in their southern ranges. Um, and, and that population that's north of Revelstoke, um, you know, there's, there's 184 of them and there's still connection uh, over to Wells Gray. There's still a population between them in, in Groundhog. Um, 
and, and it's kind of that that real last viable shot at saving them in the southern ranges and only about 40 percent of, of their habitat is protected um, and a recent analysis shows that the Revelstoke Shushwap lost um, nearly 200 square kilometers of caribou habitat to logging uh, between 2000 and 2012. Um, this is not a great photo, but it was a it was a little special experience I had in in the northern Monashies, and and um, I came over a ridgeline, and uh, there was kind of this little hump between well me and me and this caribou, but um, I ended up being close enough that I could uh, as the caribou moved, and and this was like a a younger female caribou. Um, as the caribou moved, you could hear uh, the sound of, of caribou have two tendons um, near, near their ankle. And every time they move, uh, if you're close enough, and, and you can see it with the, or you can hear it with the big Arctic caribou herds as they move, but with, with these smaller herds, um, if you're close enough to individual animals, you can hear that clicking sound um, and the best way I can describe it is kind of like uh, the sound of when you have a campfire and you have um, embers that are kind of erupting in that campfire. And that's kind of what that clicking tendon sound sounds like. Um, but uh, me and this caribou are actually more than one. And uh, because I, I was climbing up and I was bushwhacking and and I just drank from this stream um, that I thought was was a little spring. And uh, then I got um, up to this knoll and and I was just watching this caribou. And as well, the first thing this caribou did when it when it seen that I was watching her after about, you know, three or four minutes um, was take a big poop. In, in this little stream that fed my, uh, my quote unquote um, little spring that I thought was there. So, you know, <laughs> I might still be carrying around some of that, whatever I got from this caribou. Um, but really the prime jewel of, of this ecosystem are these ancient and, and, and often really magical um, cedar hemlock stands. And they're low elevation and there's not a whole lot of them left, um, but they're, they're, they're incredible. And Devil's Club often makes up a lot of, of the understory in, in these forests and, and which is also an incredible plant. Um, and in places it can get up to, you know, 10 feet high and it, it makes for some, some interesting um, bushwhacking, to say the least. Uh, this is a photo from, from the Incomaplu Valley, just south of Revelstoke. And uh, a phenomenal valley that, that many folks have, have fought to protect for a very long time and, and hopefully um, soon we'll be seeing some of that that protection um, for this valley. Uh, yeah, and, and these forests are, are, are just incredible. I mean, um, this is actually one from the Seymour as well. Um, and the importance of a lichen is one of the things that really stands out about the ITR, the Inland Tever Rainforest. And, and uh, on the left, um, kind of in this upper section, there's, there's kind of a whitish, grayish, little bit of green um, lichen that's, that's Tuckerman's coral lichen. Um, and previously, a lot of these lichens they thought were, were just you know, isolated to, to coastal rainforests. Um, and, and sometimes they're common and sometimes they're not, but, but a lot of these lichens um, also occur in the inland temperate rainforest. And really it's in these, these wet and super wet 
cedar hemlock stands. And, um, you know, a recent scientific paper described the ITR as, as perhaps the most species rich lichen temperate rainforest in the world. And of course, lichens are a very good indicator of biodiversity and, and the health of, of forests. And, and so where you have um, these, these different lichen species, uh, you, you often have those, those healthier forests. And, and um, you know, obviously it, it takes a, a lot of time and, and um, to grow a lot of these things. And, and these, these forests have evolved for millennia. And these forests are incredible carbon stores. Um, and I think we're, we're just starting to understand that. And in 2013, a, a group of scientists um, released the first baseline carbon stock, uh, you know, total forest carbon estimates for, for managed um, being logged and unmanaged being, you know, natural um, cedar hemlock stands of the inland temperate rainforest. And their research estimated that in, in these natural old growth ICH forests, um, total forest carbon was, was similar to the average of, of coastal rainforests, which are considered to be, you know, amongst the, the most carbon rich forests in the world. Um, and the study found once we clear cut those forests, um, these old growth forests, we lose 70% of, of that carbon um, pretty quickly. And um, even when you consider things like uh, uh, carbon storage in wood products, um, et cetera. And, and a lot of these forests, um, you know, the, the big driver is, is the large cedar. Um, everything else is, is kind of in the way of, um, or, or that's, you know, the, the prize. Um, hemlock, a lot of the time, which, which often dominates these stands, uh, is kind of in the way. And um, often it's, it's lucky if it even gets hauled away. Um, often it's, it's uh, chipped for, for paper. Um, and you know, you're making these, these 400, 500 year old hemlock trees into, into paper, into toilet paper, right? And so, you know, by continuing to harvest um, or log, these stands were majorly impacting carbon. And, and if you say log um, 600 hectares of, of old growth um, cedar hemlock, you, you may have 300,000 tons of carbon in that forest. And when you clear cut that forest, that 600 hectares, you're, you're releasing upwards of 200,000 tons of carbon. And, and this photo is, is from the, the Big, Mouth, uh, Big Mouth Creek north of, of Revelstoke. Um, this was a BCTS, BC Timber Sales um, sale that was that was bought by uh, Downey out of Revelstoke, um, and just phenomenal, um, irreplaceable forest, right? And a little bit of a transition here, but it's it's kind of impossible to to talk about the inland temperate rainforest and. Um, without talking about, you know, the dams in, in the southern portion of this ecosystem and, and the dams on the Columbia River. And of course, the flooding of the Columbia resulted in, in a lot of losses in, in productive um, ecosystem and, and valley bottom forests and, and you know, these, these spectacular gravel bed river floodplains. Um, so obviously, uh, that, that first loss of, of uh, ancient forests and, and productive forests in the ITR was, was the damming of the Columbia and the creation of, of these reservoirs. Um, 
including uh, the 236 kilometer long Kinbasket Lake, which basically stretches from, you know, north of Golden all the way up to, to Valmont. And um, which was created by, by this, this dam. And, and this is the uh, Mica Dam. And in human terms, this dam isn't, um, isn't that old. Uh, it was 1973. Um, you know, the Grand Coulee, I think, was, was mid-40s, early 50s, um, which, which, of course, blocked, the, um, blocked salmon um, from the upper Columbia system. And, um, and Revelstoke Dam was, was right around 1981, I think it was completed. Uh, but, but, you know, these reservoirs are a relatively uh, new thing in, in the Columbia system. And, and this river, of course, um, and, you know, when I talk about the Columbia system, that, that essentially makes up, you know, in terms of the Canadian portion of, of uh, the inland temperate rainforest, you know, roughly half of, of the inland temperate rainforest. The rest uh, is in the Fraser and the and the Thompson, the Thompson obviously a tributary of, of uh, the Fraser system. And that river, um, the Columbia, was once one of the great salmon rivers of North America and, and potentially the most productive salmon river in North America. And and Chinook um, and Sockeye. And, and steelhead making, you know, 2000 kilometer journeys to nourish the soul of, of this, this great river. Um, and, and those salmon and, you know, upper Columbia forests are, are uh, um, so interconnected. And, and um, that was the huge one of, yeah, it was the hugest loss to that ecosystem. Um, and of course, there is a major um, and incredible Indigenous-led movement to reintroduce salmon to the Upper Columbia, led by the Tanaha, this, this likes, and, and um, supported by BC and Canada. And uh, hopefully one day we will see salmon in, in the Upper Columbia. Um, So yeah, in terms of those reservoirs, this photo is of a of a massive um, spruce tree, probably I don't know a meter, a meter and a half in in diameter, that's actually underwater, um, in, uh, under um, the, well this is this is just uh, south of of Mica Dam, um, the reservoir that was created by the Revelstoke Dam, so. Uh, you know, there was, there was such a rush uh, prior to flooding um, and there was a real race to get these forests out of the way um, that a lot of these cut trees were never hauled away. Um, they were left where they were felled. Um, and then there was the flooded portion of, of the Columbia that, that went out over top. And, and so, you know, when you, when you spend time on, on that waterway, whether you're north of Revelstoke or, or in the Arrow Reservoir, um, Arrow Lakes region, um, or in the Kinbasket, uh, a lot of wood is still floating and, and some of these massive trees are still on the shorelines and, and there's stumps like this, um, you know, this, this big spruce. It, it's kind of uh, haunting in a way. And just to um, kind of illustrate that, that point on with a little bit of a visualization around, you know, those low elevation valley bottom forests that were lost. This is an old topo uh, map of, of the Big Bend area, um, the Big Bend of the Columbia River. You know, the Columbia River starts at, starts at Invermeer and, and starts going north. And, and then there's this giant bend. Um, that's what it's at uh, boat encampment um, where the, the canoe river, which is the most northern tributary, comes in um, into the Columbia. So this is about 180 kilometers north of Revelstoke, 120 north of, of Golden. 
And um, so I'm just gonna, gonna flip through these two photos a few times. So, this is the Wood River. Um, but yeah, a lot of that valley bottom forest is, is now underwater. And then this is a little bit north of that, um, the Canoe River, uh, just south of, of Valemont. And yeah, that's a visualization. Um, UVic actually did that, uh, did that little mapping project. And, um, and I'm gonna get to positive things as well. But uh, the history, you know, of, of the Columbia River um, or of, of the Inland Temperate Rainforest, it's, it's kind of impossible uh, not to mention Hamburg Provincial Park because it did protect a, a really big chunk of, of the Inland Temperate Rainforest. And this was a park that was created in 1941. Um, and it was, it was more than 1 million hectares um, in size at the time. And so uh, in the south here, we have, we have Golden. And so it encompassed um, the Blaybury River north of Golden, uh, the northern, you know, the, this part of the, the Rockies, um, the portion of the northern Selkirks and, and connected all the way up to Mount Robson Provincial Park. Mm -hmm. and, um, and also over to, to Banff and, and Jasper um, at the height of land of, at the Continental Divide. And, you know, this was one of the, the finest wilderness parks in the world. And it was, it was larger than Tweedsmere Provincial Park, which is currently British Columbia's largest provincial park. Um, and in one fell swoop of, of the pen, it was, it was kind of, well, it was decimated. Um, in 1964 or 65, uh, it was reduced by 98% um, due to pr pressure exerted by the forest industry um, and, and planned, you know, planned damming of the, high, of the Columbia River um, and the rerouting of the Trans-Canada Highway um, through Rogers Pass. And uh, it's just, a, a, you know, um, there's, there's some compensation that needs to happen for, for some of the historic things that have happened in this ecosystem. And, and this is one of those examples. And, and a researcher by the name of, of Ben Bradley um, chronicles this history about Hamber Park. And, and I think it's a, it's a phenomenal read. And, and if you're, well, if you're a nerd like me, it's a phenomenal read. And one of the areas I'd love to touch on is, is the Cummins River Valley. Uh, it's, it's just north of Golden um, by about 120 kilometers. Um, and it's this incredible unroaded and intact drainage, uh, a Rocky Mountain rainforest. Um, in the 90s, the, you know, the Cummins was this fight um, and a local logging company wanted to get into this place um, and, and log there. Um, and, and we as Wild Sight, we were fortunate enough to be able uh, to help protect this place during the provincial land use planning process that happened in the 90s. And fortunately, we had a campaigner named Ellen Zimmerman, um, who was tough as nails and tenacious. And, and that's kind of one of the things you have to be if, if you live in, in you know, these resource-based towns and, and you're doing conservation work. Um, and she helped get this, this place protected um, as, as the Cummins Lake Provincial Park. It's about 26,000 hectares. Um, and, and Ellen passed uh, away about a year and a half ago. And I got, a, I got to interview her um, a few years back. Um, 
and I asked her about the Cummins and, um, and it was, it was super interesting. And, and she had actually never, um, been to that, that place prior to protecting it. Um, but you know, she, she told me here was this remote and unique valley that's almost impossible to access. And it was full of ancient old growth cedar and hemlock. And, and it was about to be logged for the cedar, you know, with the rest potentially wasted. And, and the Cummins, uh, this Rocky Mountain rainforest whose mystery and remoteness added to its allure. I had experienced so much bad logging in the region around Kent Basket Lake and the loss of all that habitat under the reservoir behind the mica dam was a big factor and the breathtaking beauty of the commons with the twin lakes and, and verdant meandering lower river valley was a big factor in my inspiration. When I finally did get there on the ground in 1997 to do a bird survey, the reality was far less romantic. Chin High Devil's Club and the world's worst most no CMs and mosquitoes ever clamoring around over slippery down gigantic spruce trees and moose, lots of moose. And uh, there's, there's Ellen um, amidst those, those mosquitoes, um, but really a, a phenomenal force um, for nature and, and for our region as well. And, and she made sure that uh, you know, we, we needed to, she made sure to point out that, that we need to protect um, those places for, um, not for ourselves, um, but for, for all living things. Um, and, and so here, uh, you know, this is, this is kind of the reality of, of what continues to happen in the Inland Tepper Rainforest. And um, I, I don't mean to dwell on the negative, um, but it, it's, it's sometimes hard not to in these incredible forests. Um, you know, this was a stand I walked uh, about two years ago and it was full of, full of these, these ancient um, trees with, you know, unique forked, um, out canopies and and um, the difference when you walk into that forest and and see it logged is is stark um, and it's it's kind of heart wrenching. And you know this is this is the reality. Um, yeah, uh, on that on this big cedar here, you have. Um, what's called a, a car strap, uh, which are placed prior to logging, because um, these these big cedars often have a bit of root rot in their core, um, and so when someone goes to fall it, um, it's a bit unpredictable. So they keep that um, on there, so when they fall the trees, that it that it stays together um, at least till till they're done falling and when it hits the ground. And you know these trees are. Um, I have I have a colleague who's done some estimating around uh, around how old versus um, size, and and he suggests that per every meter in diameter in the inland temperate rainforest, uh, it takes it takes about um, five hundred years to get a meter in diameter, and some of these trees are are nearing, um, a lot of them are well over two meters, um, some probably cl closer to three, the, the largest trees, you know, probably in that, in that 2.5 to 2.8, 2.9 meters in diameter. And of course, this is also in, in um, critical caribou habitat. And yeah, massive, um, yeah, 
hundreds and hundreds of years old. And I think this photo um, kind of symbolizes where we're at today. You know, we're really at a tipping point and, um, you know, the blocks are laid out and the road is going in. Um, and, and we've got a, a provincial government that says they want to protect old growth, but uh, the trees keep falling. And um, this is a, a, a phenomenal stand in the Seymour River that's, that's currently laid out. And the next, I've got a little clip, um, kind of just around getting a little bit more of a, of a landscape level view of, of some of that logging and, and what it looks like. And, and this is also in, in critical caribou habitat. So, and I, it's, it's a time lapse um, from Google Earth images and it's from, uh, it's created by Wild Confluence Films and, and David Moskowitz. Growth forest and caribou habitat in British Columbia. Why? Why? Yeah. I don't know. I'm not a policymaker. I'm not a politician. You have to ask those folks. Growth forest and caribou habitat in British Columbia. Why? Why? Yeah. I don't know. I'm not a policymaker. I'm not a politician. You have to ask those folks. And, and BC plans, you know, to continue to log these old growth forests in the ITR, in the Inland Temperate Rainforest for, for the next three decades. Um, and, uh, and yeah, this is a big hemlock. Um, that's, you know, it, it always symbolizes to me that the waste in this ecosystem, because these, these trees um, very rarely um, get used for, for anything high value. Um, and, and they're just phenomenal. And, and, you know, really scientists are, are warning us, um, and, and telling us that BC's rare and temper rainforest is, is at risk of, of collapse and in less than a decade. If, if logging continues at its current place. So there is this very short time window or opportunity to protect this ecosystem. And that study is, is done by uh, Dominic De La Sala, um, who researches temper, uh, temperate rainforests um, all, over, all over the globe. Um, and, you know, he, he calls uh, the, he and his colleagues call uh, the Inland Temperate Rainforest one of the most imperiled temperate rainforests in the world. So, you know, the clock is ticking and every um, month that there is, uh, that these trees continue to fall, um, that that ecosystem continues to be at higher risk. And this is a, a graph that uh, um, this is this is from that paper by Dominic De La Sala and and uh, Michelle Connolly, um, Darwin Coxon, and and others. Um, so this top panel uh, is the an entire um, inland temperate rainforest. These these three here, the bottom is just the the rare um the wet and super wet um cedar hemlock stands so so just that that wetter region that that's north that starts north of, of nelson to to kind of the fraser river um so what this is showing uh 
is that we are um, kind of at that that sort of tipping point right now, and um, you know um, the this is this is showing um, the amount a is showing the amount of original old growth forests, um, the current amount, and c is showing you know uh, the the losses. And what you see in, in red here and orange is that, you know, we're, we're at a place where between 50 and 80% of the original old growth forest um, is gone, depending on where you are. And what we know from science and, and from, you know, a, a lot of the work that was done around forests and ecosystems in BC is that once you get to less than 30% of old growth, um, you're really in a high risk scenario for biodiversity. And, and that is kind of where we're at right now. Um, and, and we're on the cusp of that, or, or in some places we're already there. And, and I think, you know, some of those photos kind of documented what that looks like on, on the ground. And, and, and the challenge is that in, industry is pushing into the last best stands um, in the inland temperate rainforest and, and they are largely unprotected. Um, and, and, and I think there's also an opportunity there where we, we still do have this old growth um, and that's critical. So I wanted to talk about Argonaut Creek. Um, and when this is a old growth valley um, in critical caribou habitat north of north of Revelstoke. Um, and when I first ventured into this place and, and when we as an organization um, first started working on this issue, um, this and, and when I yeah when I first went in there um, it was it was really to document that um, this old growth valley was about to be lost and um, and, it, and it was a phenomenal place um, and I, and I really wanted to kind of experience that place and and so um, me and my brother bushwhacked in into this drainage and and as we walked up this this forest service road that they were they were punching in and, and falling trees um and blasting rock to get into this drainage um it, it was it was unbelievable um you know these 50 meter tall hemlocks um one of them actually actually fell because one of the the fellers um just left the tree to hang um, really, really kind of dangerous. And we heard that fall um, not very far from us. And uh, when you hear an old growth tree fall, it's, uh, it just gives you shivers. Um, and, and I think, um, and, and when we went in here, um, it was this, this phenomenal experience of, of rock walking these these big ridge lines and and experiencing some of these old growth forests um, with massive trees and but also uh, you know this was this was them punching the road and and seeing these century old trees on the ground um, and and as I mentioned uh, the plan from BC timber sales was for uh, 15 to 20 kilometers of, of new road into Argonaut and 300 hectares of old growth logging in, in critical caribou habitat. The green is all um, federally designated core caribou habitat. Um, and you can see the blocks all, all overlap that in the upper portion. Um, and fortunately, uh, this story kind of connected with people and um, there was significant and, and pretty incredible public um, pressure and, you know, really significant First Nation leadership on this issue from, from the 
um, the Swatsim and uh, the Chinaha Nation. And um, fortunately, um, a lot of that logging was halted. And uh, last, um, when was that? I guess that was December 2020. Let me think if I'm doing the math there right. Yeah, it was, it was December 2020 um, that uh, after a lot of pressure from the province, um, they, they, or after a lot of pressure from the public and, and indigenous leadership, um, they, they halted development um, and paused uh, in 11 of 14 of those cut blocks in Argonaut. And that, that was critical and, and that was a huge win. Um, and so um, 11 of 14, um, but as of, you know, early 21, um, 2021, three cut blocks still remained and, and there's still five in, in the neighboring drainage of Big Mouth Creek. Um, and uh, just in, in July of 2021, so about six months ago, um, a group of Revelstoke locals started a blockade um, there uh, in, the, in the Big Mouth and, and for Argonaut Creek. Um, to stop that logging. And in, in a month later, in July, that blockade was, was visited um, by Sequemic Chief uh, Kukbi Wayne Christian uh, and um, BC uh, Association of, of First Nations or Assembly of First Nations Chief Terry Tiji. Um, they they conducted a ceremony and blessed um, those those land protectors, um, and really a, a really powerful ceremony. Um, and and as we speak, those those um, folks are still manning that blockade north of Revelstoke. And just over a month ago, after you know um, again more pressure from from those nations in the public. The BC government agreed to defer um, logging in in the remaining three cut blocks in Argonaut Creek. Um, so a huge win there. Um, but uh, yeah, the, the blockade is is still up there in one of the snowiest um, places in the world, a place that gets you know uh, well over thirty feet of snow every year, and and very cold temperatures. And I think, um, you know, an, another area that that's going to be a fight um, and, and that we're going to have to take on and, and hopefully the public uh, will take on as well is, is the Seymour River um, that, I, that I spoke about earlier, uh, about 100 kilometers north of, of Salmon Arm. Uh, Louisiana Pacific and, and BC timber sales have, have more than 600 hectares of, of old growth logging um, planned here in, in caribou habitat. And, and this is one of the blocks, really ancient trees, some of which are, are nearing three meters in, in diameter. Um, and really an incredibly important area for caribou. Um, in, in last year's caribou census that, that took place in the North Columbia Mountains. I think it was 100 of 164 individuals that they observed from the helicopter were in this uh, Seymour Blaze um, uh, Ratchford epicenter area um, where, where these cut blocks are. So really direct overlap. Um, and and I, as I mentioned earlier, only 40% of, of that habitat is protected for the Columbia North caribou herd. And, um, you know, this is again in, in that, was, that was the original um, intro slide from Stephanie. And um, 
as you can see on the left, there's road ribbon. And, and these trees are, are massive and they're unbelievable. Um, and in places like this, there, there are caribou trails directly through forests like this. Um, and, and as you can see, these are laid out um, to, be, to be harvested. Um, some of these blocks have, have uh, a little bit of overlap with some of the old growth deferral polygons um, that, that came out in uh, October. Um, but uh, again, with, with the caribou issue, it's, it's more about the creation of, of uh, young forest and, and the loss of, of some of this old growth habitat. And of course, in October, um, the province did, did announce that they intend to move forward um, with, with logging, uh, or sorry, with, uh, with protecting, um, deferring logging in 2.6 million hectares of, of old growth, um, pending discussions with Indigenous nations. And you know, I, I think that's uh, a big transition for the province, and and for the first time um, in BC's history, we we have a provincial government that's actually acknowledging the state of of BC's forests and and our irreplaceable forests. So I think that's a huge step. Um, and and the technical advisory panel, you know, recommended protecting those, those 2.6 million hectares are deferring logging to, to kind of um, stop the bleed in our ecosystems. And um, the, the really key piece, I think, in that announcement, the only, the only um, deferrals that actually hit the ground running were in new BCTS timber sale, BC timber sales. Um, and BCTS controls about a fifth of the cut in BC. Um, and BC also announced, you know, 12.6 million av available over the next three years to support uh, Indigenous nations and bands in that in that process. Um, I think there's 205 bands in BC, um, so that that does not work out to, to much money per per nation or band. Um, I think $58,000 per per band. Um, and you know the pro province uh, announced they're developing supports for workers um, and nations um, through new programs, but but that was kind of uh, a little bit vague. And, and so clearly, um, one of the things that was was missing one was was real action um, from that announcement, and and really deferrals that actually hit the ground running, um, apart from in, in BCTS areas. And, and now we're kind of in this vague stage um, where, where companies are, are sometimes still logging in these areas as well and, and um, either on old permits um, or trying to advance new permits as well. So, uh, the, you know, there needs to be supports for, for Indigenous nations um, and rural communities. And, and you know, th those funds don't cut it. Um, and, and we need conservation financing. And, and we need the kind of um, supports that don't make this a decision between just, just purely um, economic development and conservation. Um, we need to also incentivize conservation. And, and that's what was really missing. Um, from the province in, in that announcement. Um, and, you know, I think for this ecosystem, the, the scientific recommendation for the inland temperate rainforest is, is to protect, you know, 45% or 50% or of, of that um, ecosystem in order to preserve biodiversity. So, you know, we're, we're not there. Um, and, and I think there's a lot of opportunity um, for conservation in this ecosystem. And, and for me, I, I, I find a lot of hope in, in places like this and in, in these old growth stands that, that exist, um, you know, nowhere else. And, and um, 
right now, you know, there are, are, are so many people across this, this province fighting for a brighter future for our forests. Um, and uh, that, that definitely gives me hope. And um, yeah, I, I think, you know, my ask for you um, is, you know, to continue to, to bring things forward with your elected officials and, and to support and, and spread awareness about this ecosystem, but also, um, you know, old growth protection and, and the implementation of the old growth strategic review, because um, there is going to be a lot of backlash and, and there already is. Um, and, and another really critical piece is to support um, the, there's a, there's a phenomenal initiative um, the federal government has signed on to uh, protect 30% of, of Canada's lands and waters um, by 2030. And, um, and I think, you know, there's a lot of phenomenal um, projects being led by First Nations to protect their territories. Um, and I think the way we get more of, of the inland temperate rainforest protected is through indigenous led conservation and things like indigenous protected and conserved areas. And, and so the federal government has committed to protecting 30% of, of Canada's lands and waters. BC has not. And, uh, and so I think that's, that's really the key message and, and hopefully, well, I'm, I'm going to, end it there and, and uh, open it up for questions and, and thank you. Thank you, Eddie. I like your parting shot there. Um, we have a, a whole bunch of questions that came up while you were talking. So, um, and I'm sure there will be many more. So maybe I'll just start kind of heading back in the chat and, I think the first questions that I saw were related to your early um, maps of the distribution of the inland temperate rainforest. So one was, are the old growth cedar forests near Fernie included? Also the ones in the western ranges of the Rockies near Radium Hot Springs. Yeah, um, <laughs> it's a good question. I mean, I guess it, def you know, there's all of these different ways um, of defining these, this ecosystem. And um, those are our remnant ecosystems of, of the inland temperate rainforest. And, and you know, the, the lizard range and, and um, the ICH there um, would, have, would have stretched uh, more consistently across the Bull River. And then there's a stand on the backside of the steeples that is it's just phenomenal. Um, cedar hemlock as well. Um, and, and so those are kind of remnants of, of the inland temperate rainforest and, and whether it's just kind of more of a rain shadow effect um, or, or not um, is, is kind of a question. And, and so, yeah, they're, they're remnants of the inland temperate rainforest. And then um, the Albert River is, as well. I think that's the one you're referring to um, kind of near, near radium. Um, and, uh, yeah, phenomenal forests, um, and and they're kind of those those uh, you know fragments that were left for for whatever reason, whether it was the the rain shadow or or et cetera. Great, thank you. And along those same lines, there was a question about the classification and wondering um, if you're if you are kind of defining or you the inland temperate rainforest or. Um, using a classification that's broader than the ICH. Is that an I ICH that's inland coastal? So, yeah, hemlock? Like, I mean, that's interior cedar hemlock. Um, interior cedar hemlock, yeah. Yeah, and, and you know, when, when I talk about, you know, the interior um, temperate rainforest ecosystem, um, I think, you know, a lot of that has to do with, with the ICH, um, but also, you know, all of the forests that are included, whether that's um, Engelman spruce, subalpine fir, um, in, in those uh, higher elevation stands, 
um, or, or even more mixed forests. And, and so I, I kind of see it as that, that larger ecosystem and, and, um, you know, obviously the ICH has, has a lot to do with it. Um, but, but when I, I think of it more as a system and of course, um, you know, the, the truest rainforest quote unquote is the wet and the wet or wet and the super wet stands of, of ICH, um, which really only occur from, you know, 50 degrees north to about 54 degrees north. Um, so from, you know, uh, north of Nelson, you know, uh, Trout Lake, Revelstoke, Nacosp area to about the upper Fraser, that those are the true, true rainforests. Um, Great. And then there's also questions about, you know, a lot of people also include the, the Kispi Ox um, in, into that inland temperate rainforest. I know Darwin Coxon from UNBC does um, because it's, it's you know, um, classified as, a, as an inland rainforest as well. And that's more in that, that terrace area. Great. Um... This is just a comment while we're on the topic of uh, where these forests are and how they're defined and their boundaries, um, that this person was surprised to see that there was no inland temperate forest in Russia and Siberia. Are and they maybe little is, pockets that are too small to see on the map? There, there is or there was. Um, okay. the, the person's right. Um, I, I, yeah, when I... I used that map. I was hoping no one was going to point that out, but um, <laughs> yeah, they're, they're, you know, um, Russia, Siberia, that is the other inland temperate rainforest. It is much more fragmented though. Okay. Um, and I was thinking maybe you should stop screen sharing so we could see you a little bit more. Yes. That's okay. Perfect. Thank you. Great. And, um, Okay, so here's another comment. Beautiful photos and very thought-provoking talk. What role do wolf populations have in keeping the IRF ecologically healthy? Do you still see wolves in the Monashi or Selkirks? Um, so I, I assume IRF, does that mean ITR maybe? Oh, inland, uh, yeah. I, I, I would so. assume, we're gonna, we're gonna make that assumption. Yeah, I think um, so. You know, I, I mean, obviously, wolves have a have a key ecosystem role, um, and you know that has really kind of come out of balance with the amount of of early cereal forest or, or young forest um, that's currently in the inland temperate rainforest. You know, um, we we now have in a lot of these places where we have caribou we have three to four times the amount of young forest than we would have had historically historically this was um, a, a rainforest that had between you know um, 76 to 86 or yeah 69 to 86 percent old growth forest in it um, we've now kind of flipped that on its head and the majority of forest in this system are, are young forests because of, of logging and clear cuts. Um, and so that makes for very good moose, elk, and white-tailed deer habitat. Um, and of course, those critters also bring in, in wolves. Um, and, you know, caribou kind of become the bycatch, but, but it's that underlying, um, that underlying disturbance that's, that's causing um, that kind of out of balance ecosystem. And um, I, I would say that, you know, um, wolves couldn't access a lot of these places historically just because of the deep snow. And, and um, but certainly they have a huge role in, in this ecosystem. Um, and do I still see wolves? Yeah, I, I still see tracks and, and especially in areas that have uh, kind of those denser um, moose populations. Um, yes, yeah, there's in the Monashies and Selkirks for sure. Great, thank you. Um, there's been, uh, maybe we can get to this after some questions, but there's some interesting comments, I think about, um, 
logging and effective protest measures like there's been some blockades in victoria and some discussion about whether or not that's effective except or maybe turning people against their cause um but maybe we'll skip that for now we could get back to what you think is the best way to to have action um also some discussion about um, selective logging and the end of old growth logging and then a question about just curious where is the bulk of that harvested wood going mm. is it sold in canada or the us or elsewhere um a lot of the stuff north of revelstoke um it it does you know a lot of the cedar anyway um gets gets made into into some higher value products um things like like two by twelves that <laughs> really they only make out of old growth wood. Um, and, and a lot of that market is, uh, you know, America, but also um, Japan and, and also things like, like Costco for, for cedar cutting boards and, and planks. Um, and, and then of course the pulp market. Um, and so paper is, is a huge supplier of that. Um, and so um, it's going to a, a variety of, of places as, as finished products. Um, and, you know, but I, I think the, the big point there is that um, in BC, I think we can do a lot more um, with less. And, you know, the Harrop Proctor Community Forest um, just east of Nelson is producing five times the amount of jobs in, in their um, manufacturing and three times the amount of, the amount of jobs in, in their logging operations. And they're doing all of that um, while doing ecosystem-based forestry. And so I think that's kind of the model um, that, that we need to, to move towards and, and um, certainly, uh, what we're what we're doing with old growth wood is uh yeah it's it's a bit terrifying <laughs> and and you know the transition is either going to be you know now or it's going to be in in 12 years or 20 years when we run out of that old growth wood um so why not transition those communities right right now and and educate the consumers and have things labeled as old growth toilet paper or whatever it is. Um, here's a comment. Could you speak to the interior Douglas fir, please? From I'm not sure if that's, uh, if we need more explanation, if John and Heather um, Neville are still here. I, I see that you're here. I don't know if you wanna unmute or um, if you have a specific question about interior Douglas fir. Maybe I'm missing what it was referring to. Um, any comments on interior Douglas fir, Eddie, in the meantime? <laughs> <It's> <laughs> I'm not sure what they were um, looking for. I mean, you know, some of the most phenomenal fire adapted ecosystems in BC and, and also phenomenal old growth ecosystems. And obviously, the way we log in in IDF or interior Douglas fir stands is is not working, and and we're seeing that. And you know, there's numerous BC Forest Practices Board reports that okay, these places oh, are just not regenerating. Um, oh, but here we go. Okay, here you go. I, I was just uh, curious. You 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 spent a lot of time uh, mentioning the cedars and the hemlocks, Eddie, which have been really enlightening and I've enjoyed your talk. But yeah. I understand, I, and I used to live in Nelson, that there is still a lot of Douglas fir around and mm -hmm. it's a little different to coastal Douglas fir. Yeah, yeah, and, and it's more um, fire adapted and we also have it more in our, um, you know, our trench ecosystems um, and it's, it's phenomenal. Um, and you often, you'd, you know, historically, you'd have these uh, ecosystems that would burn, you know, often uh, every couple of years. Um, there's a lot of indigenous burning that, that happened in those ecosystems as well um, to, to, you know, bring about more wildlife. Um, 
And, you know, those, those are super key wildlife areas. Um, and they're, they're phenomenal and they deserve a hell of a lot of attention as well. Um, particularly because a lot of the Southern part of the province, um, you're at, you're at less than 10% of, of the historic amount of old growth right now. So you're already in this extremely high risk scenario for biodiversity and, and we're seeing, seeing that happen, right? Um, and also our, our management of, of our forests is contributing to things like floods and fires. Um, and, and we've, we've seen that um, a lot recently. And um, so, yeah, I mean, I mean, the paradigm has to shift uh, the way we do forestry across the board and in every single ecosystem. Um, but also the, you know, those old growth polygons are, are throughout BC and in each, um, in each biogeoclimatic zone. And so um, it doesn't pick between cedar hemlock or um, interior Douglas fir. Uh, it's, it's where is it at the most risk to biodiversity. And so um, that's, that's kind of the approach that the, the technical panel took. Are the Douglas firs a little higher up the mountains? Um, no, they, they're um, often valley bottom as well. Um, and so really more in, in those drier areas. Um, yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for clarifying and for your your uh, detailed um, response. Um, so along the lines of logging, oh, I think we have an answer here. Um, the community forest that you mentioned as a good example of ecosystem-based forestry. And then Robin Duncan wrote Harrop Proctor Community Forest. That's the one that you. Thanks, Robin. OK, <laughs> great. Thank you. Um, and just um, I encourage you to read through the chat, Eddie, because there's just a lot of um, real appreciation for um, for all of the the work that you're doing and for educating us all about some of these big issues. And it, like Susan wrote, it's very painful and distressing, but we need to be informed in order to make this change. And it's so much bigger than Fairy Creek. Um, yeah. Do you have any recommendations on how to, I mean, uh, things that we can do? And especially there is so much focus on Fairy Creek, which is important, but it is such a bigger issue than that. Yeah. Totally. Yes. Thank you all for um, this very engaging chat. I'm, I'm just reading through and um, really grateful for all your comments. And um, yeah. Looks like there's a few more questions as well. Um, what is your opinion of the Revelstoke Community Forest Corporation's work? Um, I think they could do a lot more to to preserve old growth and and um, you know in the '90s the when Revelstoke was going to buy that community forest. Um, they were warned that a lot of it overlaps old growth and caribou habitat. I think 90% of the 10 year overlaps caribou habitat, um, both the, the South Columbia and the North Columbia herd. Um, and, um, and, and I think, you know, there's a strong lever there because the community forest is, is open or, or, or uh, the community forest is uh, owned by the city of Revelstoke. Um, and so their management um, could be dictated that way. Um, but as well, you know, the, the problem of BC forestry is a systemic issue. Um, and, you know, um, the Revelstoke Community Forest can, can only do so much in, in certain ways, um, because if, if they don't log in certain places, um, the province will, you know, redistribute that tenure or that cut. Um, and they've done that numerous times. 
Um, but I think, you know, they can do a, a lot more um, uh, stuff to preserve old growth and caribou habitat on, on their tenure. Um, and I think, you know, some of the commercial thinning work they're doing is, is really great, but it only accounts for about 5% of, of what they're cutting. Um, and so commercial thinning going into, into uh, overstocked stands that, you know, often were, were planted um, 40, 30, 40 years ago and thinning them out and getting some wood out that's, that's you know, merchantable timber. Um, I think that's, that's a great way to get some wood out and, and I'd like to see that number increase. Um, and, uh, yeah, I, I think it's, uh, you know, practices are going to change and there are going to be winners and losers, um, in, in that battle. And I hope the Revelstoke community forest is, is willing to be one of, of, of the leaders in transitioning the forest sector. Um, what percentage of logging in BC comes from the interior rainforests? I, I do not know off the top of my head. Um, there's numerous timber supply areas that, that kind of make up that ITR region. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's definitely significant and it's definitely significant for, for the amount of old growth that, that is being harvested and from a lot of that old growth coming from, from irreplaceable forests. Um, so it's, it's certainly significant. Does anyone have any other questions? You're welcome to unmute and um, put on your camera if you want or any comments. Um, maybe you wanna make a plug for WildSite. I'm sure you're doing some uh, campaigning or. For sure, yeah. Um, Please, if you don't follow um, WildSite and, and our, our social media and also um, sign up for our, our mailing list, that would be awesome if you did. Um, we, we always can use more support um, and it just allows us to do more things on the ground. Um, and, and we're really grateful to, to have hosts like the Victoria um, Natural History Society and, and really great to connect with, uh, you know, more coastal groups. And, and um, so, so please uh, do come and, and um, check us out. And uh, yeah, that's, that's all. I just put the website in the chat so you can look through there. And I see Martha, I, I do see you have your, a question. So we, yes, we won't you. end. Yeah, no problem. It's in regard to the community forest. And Eddie, you said that um, the provincial government has some say in the logging in a community forest. And I'm curious about that. I'm from Duncan and there's 5,000 hectares of um, municipal forest here that we're trying to uh, protect and have the um, municipality of North College and stop doing cut blocks in there. Do you know the difference between a community forest and a municipal forest and why the government, provincial government has say in a community forest? Now is that a, um, in, in Duncan, is that a municipal forest or is it maybe private managed forest? No, it's a municipal forest. It's owned by the municipality of North College and Oh, really? But yeah. is it is it private land? Oh, shoot. I forget how that got acquired. Oh, I think it was. Um, so it is probably something back taxes or something from. So it, it, it might it may be private land in, in which case. Oh, no. No, we're working very strongly with it um, to it's it's owned by the municipality and they are the ones who determine the um, logging in it. So I guess it's different than a community forest. Yeah, a community forest is is uh, you know it, it'll be it'll be public land and a, and a tenure. Um, and so I I don't I don't know the situation in Duncan. Okay, and, so it's still under a tenure even though it's public land and a community forest. Yeah, and and I'm not sure. Maybe there's someone else who's more familiar with that. 
particular, I'm, I, I mean, I can follow up <laughs> for sure. I, I was Thank just you. curious because it scared me for a minute there. <laughs> I thought, <laughs> I didn't know that the province could, um, what did you say, um, just redisperse or something, the uh, tenure? Yeah, they, they can. Yeah, yeah. yeah no, so, so that just made me a bit nervous, but I think maybe it's a different situation. Okay, okay. There's a couple, Martha, there's a couple notes in the chat about it. Some other people have piped up and- Yeah, I thought it was Ian then. So, um, so yeah, anyway. and Private Managed Forest um, has, a, has a really um, brutal management. Oh, it's not private? Okay, someone said in no, the chat. Yes, a lot of the area here is mosaic and that's private managed forest land. But this isn't, this is um, municipality. And so the taxpayers actually own it. Okay. And so now we as taxpayers are trying to have our voice heard that, uh, that we want more ecological logging practices, if any at all. Totally, that's awesome. Yeah, it's a good opportunity. Yeah. You we are successful. Yeah. yeah, 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 and it's a challenge. We're also trying to do um, rights of nature and get the trees recognized as as uh, non-human entities. Yeah, non-human persons. Perfect. Awesome. Well, thank you. No, thank you. I'm sorry. I, I'm not more helpful <laughs> on that question. Good. Good. Any other any other questions or comments? We had a, a nice big crowd for you and a lot of a lot of chat and uh, comments and uh, people staying later than usual on this uh, rainy night. So thank you so much for uh, your really amazing presentation and we can all dream of caribou and uh, those beautiful big trees in the inland temperate rainforest. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks again. Good night, everybody. Good night. <laughs> Good night and thank you. Thanks a lot, everyone. Good night. Thank you so much, Eddie. Thanks, Stephanie. Thank Hi, Sylvia. Fantastic talk. Oh, thank you very much. Wonderful, wonderful evening. Thank you. Thank you all. Sobering. Very inspiring. <laughs>